Okay, so what we're going, what we're going to talk about today is the cache consistency and the C++ memory model, and specifically how it affects it out in the way that we write a code for real hardware. So, <coughs> few words about myself. Uh, I'm a team leader at uh, Cyberbit. Been programming uh, for about 15 years now, mainly in C and C++, and that's my uh, email address. We're looking for uh, talented developers, if anyone is interested, that's all, that's my email address. So, when we think about the, the hardware that we're writing for, the mental models that we have is that we have a CPU and we have a large chunk of, of uh, RAM, and the CPU just simply talks to the RAM and all the RAM is equal. It's also in any way that the compiler is only translating our code and the CPU just runs the code as we wrote it. And this was true like a few decades ago and life was very, very simple at the time. But life was also very, very slow. And then came Gordon Moore, which we all know from Moore's law, that says that the number of transist transistors in a dense integrated circuit double itself every two years. In, small, in short words, it just means that the compiler became much faster and very, very fast. If you look at this graph, that's the speed that the processor uh, speed increased, and that's the speed, the lower uh, line is the way that the memory increased. And you see the gap that started to build over the years between the two graphs. So if, it, if running an instruction takes us like one or two seconds, and fetching an instruction takes us like 200 cycles, it means the CPU is idle, just waiting for data for 99.5% for of the time. The ideal solution would obviously be to have a very large amount of very, very fast memory. Unfortunately, that's not very possible. First of all, because the price, creating very, very fast memory is very expensive. Secondly, it's not physically possible. So instead of this, the, the way that we tackle this problem in order to reduce the time to wait for, for memory to arrive is by dividing the memory into hierarchies. So instead of having this simplistic uh, architecture, what we really have is this. This is a bit closer to what we actually write for. We have layers of, of cache. Each layer, the, each layer is uh, getting smaller, but much, much faster. Now, I said it's much, much faster, but it doesn't really have to say a so I, get, I wrote some figures. If one cache is like two to four seconds, it's really, really fast, but we have very, very little of it. On the other hand, we have the main memory to take 100 or 200 cycles to fetch memory from, but we have plenty of it. Now, I said small and slow, and it doesn't really convey the time. So when we see a lot of figures, what we normally have to do with the programmers is have a graph. So I probably just the graph. But it still doesn't really show everything. So I said, okay, one picture is worth a lot. So if L1 is the height of a sitting down giraffe, the memory is the Empire State Building. But it still doesn't really convey just how slow it is. So I created an, an animation. Now this one is to scale. This is just how slow fetching data from main memory really is. That's not swap out to disk. That's just how slow it is. Now, while we're waiting for the memory to arrive, let me just say that most profilers, when the CPU is now waiting for the memory to arrive, will show the CPU as 100% utilized. So if we see the, the CPU as 100% utilized, it can be that 99% is just sitting there idly waiting for the memory to arrive, waiting for the operation, for the operands, or waiting for the instruction to arrive from main memory, and then it's just only 1% of the time it's actually doing any real work. So let's give it a few more seconds just to arrive, because I worked really hard on this presentation, on this animation, sorry, and you can smell it now, it's really coming, and We have, we have it. Finally, it arrived. <laughs> That's the scale. 
Let's see how it affects when you actually write software. So, I believe if we have a big matrix and we want to scan it, I believe it won't come as a big surprise if we scan row by row, we're uh, taking, we sequentially uh, scanning the, the memory, so it's much faster than column by column, which we jump a lot. But the question that we want, that we need to ask ourselves is, does uh, jumping, is uh, scanning the matrix column by column, is actually the slowest? And the answer is obviously no, because otherwise this question would be kind of redundant. So no. If I'm scanning the, the matrix randomly, I'm just picking a play uh, itself, it's much, much slower. It's like twice slower. So the first question we want to ask ourselves is why? Why is it slower? And the answer is, is the prefetch. The compiler says, okay, I took this bit, then I jumped one x byte forward, and I took one byte, and then I jumped another uh, x byte, the same amount of bytes forward and took another uh, byte. So let's think, what can be the next one of that grid? <coughs> I know. Let's jump another, another same distance. So it just prefetches the memory for us. The compiler or the CPU? The CPU, sorry, yes. The CPU, of course. So just prefetch the, the memory for us. The second why that we want to ask ourselves is why would we scan it randomly? So when we just scan a matrix, obviously it doesn't make a lot of sense to scan it randomly. But if you think about all the non-consecutive containers, list, hash, set, that's what we do. If you use a vector of pointers or references, yes, the vector itself is continuous, but every item that we reference is still randomly around. So we're actually doing this much more frequently than we think. Now what will happen if we change the size? I don't know if anyone noticed, but this matrix was 1,025 or 1,025. What if we reduce it by one? Well, not surprisingly, the 1,024 will remain the same. The one, the 1,025, and this is 1,024, will actually decrease the performance almost by two. In order to understand why, we need to understand a bit more about the cache management. So what are the requirements from the cache? We want the swapping in and out from and to the cache to be very, very efficient. We want very, very fast to look up because we don't spend a lot of time looking for the cache just to realize that we don't have it. We don't want maintenance. We want the maintenance to be minimal. We want the cache to be non-consecutive because different cores use different processes that need different data. And even the same core that's running the same application needs need to, to do, have different segments of data. But we do want some locality because if I'm touching one instruction, it's very, very likely that I'll need the next one uh, very, very soon. So in order to do this, we have cache line. Cache line is a fixed block of memory, fixed size block of memory, and that's the smallest cacheable unit. We never cache anything smaller than a cache line. We can't talk about anything smaller than cache line when we talk about cache. So when I need any chunk memory, even if it's one bit, I have to cache the whole cache line. So if now I need the, this byte, each one of these is a cache line, I'll just bring the whole cache line into the cache. So this reduces the fragmentation, it, make, it makes the swapping in and out very fast, but, it doesn't, but I don't want to check the whole cache line, the whole cache for, for a cache line. So in order to tackle this one, every cache line has let's say a color, and each color can go into a certain amount of slots in the cache. So each cache line can go into a very small subset of slots in, in, in the cache. So if, I, for example, I want this yellow cache line, it can go into either of these three slots, along in these three slots. So when I want to look for it, I need only to check these three slots. So let's say it's, it's got into this slot, when I want the next yellow uh, cache line, it will go, for example, to here. 
So what happened in the 1024? Uh, it's obviously not a number that I just picked, 1024. It's a number that I chose specifically to take so each row would have exactly the same color. It would go into exactly the same <coughs> slots as the previous row. So if you look at it, the performance that we got on 124 is very, very close to the performance that we got when we couldn't use the prefetch. Because now the prefetch cannot do a lot. Because it keeps using only the same slot, only the same very small amount of slots in the, in the cache. So it's a bit better because we have four or eight slots that we can use. But it's not as good as the 125 that used the whole cache. But it really depends on the catch. It really depends on the hardware. It's very hard to but we always will have a lot less because if we have a sensitivity of 16, for example, which is considered very large, yes, we'll take better uh, use of the cache. Yeah. But it's still not as good as with 125 that I use the whole cache. Yeah. Because we hash collision. Yeah. I take very bad usage of the cache. So that's why we have. Uh, when I reduce the size, we got worse performance. When we talk about uh, multi cores, we have another consideration: it's false sharing. I assume that most of you know what false sharing is. If not, there's plenty of material on the net, including my talk in the CPP, uh, in the course CPP conference which I explained in greater detail, but it basically means that cores do not share the same data. Each core has its own data, but they do share the same cache line. It requires that few, uh, few cores will touch the same piece of data frequently, and at least one of them needs to be a writer. We normally talk about, cache, uh, about false uh, sharing when we talk about arrays, it's not confined to arrays. At most, at most uh, the retrain one talks about, it talks about arrays. It's not confined only to arrays, it's confined, it can be, it can occur in heap allocation, globals, in any memory that it's continuous, even if it's a different uh, translation units. <coughs> Let's assume that you want to have lightweight counters. We have several, several uh, cores, and we want to have some counters. We have like three or five counters that we want to update. So a very simple solution would be to have the first counter. Each, each uh, core will have its own data, it will have its own counter. So, and then the second uh, counter, which will have, each uh, CPU will have its own uh, counter, and the third counter. Let's uh, measure it. In order to measure it, the way that I chose to measure it is each thread will do a predefined number of increments. So if I'm using one core, I'll do, for example, one million uh, increments. If I'm using five cores, or five strikes, I'll do five million. And I'll measure the slowdown. So the best slow, the, the best uh, result can be one, each core increment its own data, and they don't hinder each other. Right? And I can't go any better than this. We can assume that the worst could be if I'm using 31 cores, it will be 30 times, 31 times slower because I'm doing 31 times the amount of work. So if I do it sequentially, I first see the first we will work first, then the second, then the third. I can assume it would be if I'm using n threads, it would be n times slower, right? Could be worse. Could be much worse. <laughs> if you go to this point, which is 16 times, it's 50 times slower. Again, if I'm doing 16 times the amount of work, I'm doing it 50 times slower. 
50 with zero, not 15. 50 times it's slower. And when I met him, that shocked me. I expected it to be slower, I expected it not to be 60, I expected it to be higher, but I didn't expect it to be so bad. Why is that? First CPU goes and updates its own counter, everything is cool. Now the third CPU goes and increments its own counter, still brings it into cache, updates it, and it's all very cool. Now the first CPU wants to update its own counter, but the cache has been invalidated. So it's, instead of one cycle that it should take him, one or two cycles for an increment, that's to bring the whole cache again up to 200 cycles. So a naive way to tackle this would be to group it by CPU. Now I'm putting all the CPU, all the counters for the first core in one group, then all the counters for the second CPU, and then all the counters for the third CPU. Not, you're talking about cores, not CPUs. Cores, correct. So when the first core will update its counter. Now the third core will update its, its counter. Fine, the first CPU <coughs> uh, update again its counter. No one didn't hear him. All very good. That's the graph that I got. We can see it's much, much better. We get uh, up to 16 times lower. We didn't reach 60 like in the old graph. But it's still very, very far from the ideal one that we wanted to. <coughs> now, why is this? I bought a cache line. I boxed it. So when the first core updates its first counter, then the third core is its counter, or very good, the first core updates its counter, still very good, but then the second core updates its counter. And it invalidated the cache. So Exactly. Can you, how do you check what your cache line is? The cache line is dependent on the architecture. In x86, it's 64, bit or 64 bytes, sorry, or 128. But can you write portable code that checks that at runtime to add the yes. appropriate padding? You can use the line S. <coughs> well, yes, but actually no. It <laughs> 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 was faster than the uh, added the uh, yes. functions uh, in uh, the functions in the li uh, library to check uh, what is the uh, cache line, but uh, GCC and Clang decided uh, not to implement it. <laughs> Microsoft implemented it because they didn't have to support uh, only uh, uh, limited uh, the amount of uh, platforms, and for all of them the answer is uh, the same. But in the list of the C++ is supported on different platforms with different ARM has multiple answers, it depends on the version, so there is no way. But when you look at this graph, uh, okay, so obviously now I'm not in it, but when you look at this graph, it's worse the extra, let's assume that it's 128 and you may have lost a few bytes. I think it's worth it. That's the difference when you talk about real time or when it's performance critical. That's the, problem, that's the difference between a counter that you can always run, it has almost no impact. To a counter that consumes cycles, that you need to think about if to allow it or not. It's almost one. I must say that, sorry, I must say that uh, I've implemented it, but only for Intel, uh, Intel SP. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a, a, an Intel popcorn for the one group. And the answer is always the same. <laughs> 42. <laughs> that all surprised me. That up to 28, 
We got less than one and a half uh, speed up. Uh, slow down, sorry. I didn't expect it to be such a beautiful line. Now the compiler has freedom. We saw that accessing the memory can be really, really slow. So the compiler can rearrange our code. It can add, it, it, uh, so it can remove or rearrange the instructions, and it can reuse locations. <coughs> For example, if I'm using one uh, variable, one part of the function, and another only in the other part, it can reuse the same location. It, it does it in order to get better uses of the hardware, to provide better locality. So I won't have to swap, to swap a memory in. And reduce the amount of sales cycle. The only restriction that the, that the compiler has is that it has to maintain the same observable state, but from a single threaded point of view. As long as from a single thread point of view, the code it generates is the same, it's allowed to do any modification. That's the plus plus uh, talks we have to give uh, Compile Explorer. What we have here is just three lines of code. I'm having a message to publish. I set it to some sort of raw message that I have. Nullify the raw message, then signal, set a flag to one, message is ready. When I compile it with GCC 8.3, we can see, even without reading the assembly, just looking at the colors, that the first assignment that the compiler will generate is setting the flag. So if there is another thread that's looking for the flag, it can see the flag set before we actually set the message into its value. Because there's no read in here, and because by the end of this function there's, we maintain the same observable state, the compiler is allowed to do that. So the first thing that comes to mind to people is volatile. Let's volatile it. Now, volatile was introduced into the language to C in order to support memory mapped I.O. And that says a lot about what, what it forces the compiler to do. The compiler is not allowed to reorder or uh, to remove reads or sets into volatile. Because if, for example, I'm reading from a network card, the compiler cannot say, no, nah, just change the order that you read. Or, no, you don't really need to read this thing from there. It's not allowed to do it because I have to take it from the hardware. But that allow to reorder volatile with non-volatile. There's no reason why not. So in order to actually make this vol volatile work for this, I need to qualify all three uh, variables into vo as volatile. And that forbids the Every access to this is now volatile. It forbids a lot of uh, optimization the compiler can do. Uh, volatile essentially bypasses the cache, right? Volatile, yeah. It says, it says to, the, to the compiler to the compiler not to optimize it out. Bypasses the registers. It, yeah, but it just says, what well, it says, forget about the way it's implemented. What, what do you need to think about? It's, what it actually says. It's only for the compiler. It's a compiler instruction. The CPU doesn't know anything about what it was. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it still has the same cache issues. Okay. It has the same caches. It just says, don't optimize it out. Don't think that you know what you're doing. Don't that you know what the value is. You have to access ROM every time. That's what it means. That's what it insinuates. What it tells the compiler, don't reorder it and don't uh, don't think that you know what you're doing. Don't optimize it out. Don't rearrange it. Don't. Op don't. Even after it's assigned, don't assume you know what yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> if you see that, 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 that it is used afterwards, don't assume you don't have to write it. But it's, it's only for the compiler. It's only for the compiler. It's a compiler instruction. And so we said it's very, very slow, and I have to use all of them. And as you said, it's a compiler instruction. As you see, it doesn't even solve all the problems. So volatile is not really the answer. The answer that C++11 uh, gave us is a compiler barrier. Compiler barrier, as it, as, it, as, the, as it sounds, it's a barrier. What's on the one side of it cannot go to the other side. 
So I put one uh, the barrier between unless before you're, the unless you're on uh, Microsoft Visual Studio where volatile is also a barrier. I yeah, but uh, no, in most, no. uh, I think in most compilers it's also a barrier. It's no. not part of the standard, but I think that's the way. Uh, that's the, the problem. problem. Nobody else uh, has to do it. What is it? Uh, trying to get the answer. I think it was supposed to be uh, It's not part of the standard. I think uh, they, should, they should mark and create a barrier. There is a reason why it should be a barrier, Let's, but that's uh, uh, beside the scope of this talk. In order to not arrange it, rearrange it by the hardware, it has to be a barrier, but that's really not. Uh, what I want to remember is that a volatile is not, is not for synchronization between threads. It's not for concurrency. Volatile is not for concurrency. So what we have here is a, a compiler barrier. Basically, says everything before the, the barrier has to remain before the barrier. Everything after the barrier has to remain after the barrier. So I'm going just before I'm setting the flag, and then it forces the flag to be set just after uh, I've done everything before. That's like the second degree of complex bugs. The first degree is like, as we look at the code, and we realize, okay, I see, the, I see the bug in the code. Here we have to look at actually the assembly that was generated in order to see the code. Because this code looks correct, just when I saw the assembly, I, I realized that I'm setting the flag before I'm setting the message. But there's something that's a bit even harder, that the hardware has some freedom. The CPU can also rearrange instructions. It can also use several uh, function units at the same time. It, execute, it can execute instructions one instruction when it's waiting for the, for the private instruction operands. And that's, what vol that's why volatile is not really the answer because volatile is a, is a compiler instruction and it, the, C, the CPU does not know about it. So even if I'm qualifying it as uh, volatile, the CPU can still rearrange it. But wouldn't you do something like that to say an atomic operation? I'll talk about atomics in a few minutes. That's, that's what I'm heading for. It's basically mean that the CPU will execute the code, not in the instruction order that I wrote, but as in the instruction in data availability order. And this way, it reduces the time that it has to wait for, for memory to arrive. So if you have here like two cores running, one is setting answer to 42, uh, and then signal is ready. The other one waits for the signal to ready and then uh, print the result. Those instructions can be reordered. So maybe I, uh, the CPU will, array, will uh, execute the finished equals one before the answer before setting the answer. That's even if the bytecode is in the correct order. But, but out of order, it's not committed. Only when it's committed, then the other one... It's committed. It. It's committed. Because it's not... Uh, they're not uh, dependent on each other, it can be committed. And we'll see an example of this. So even if you put a barrier... Even if I put a compiler barrier... Really into one. If, I, if, I, if I put a compiler barrier, yes. I'm assuming that you can look at this as assembly. So we have to try things to communicate. They communicate by sharing pieces of data, pieces of memory. In order for, for us to be able to write anything reasonable, concurrent, concurrent, we must be able to reason about the order of reads and writes. Okay? The same core will always see its data in the correct order. So here, I'll, in this core, I'll always see the data as I should see it. Different core may see it in a different order. So the memory model is basically the sets of reordering that the, that the CPU and the compiler are allowed to do. If they're allowed to swap Store and store, store and load, load and load, load and store. And now I can limit them. 
because I need to be able to limit it. We already saw the, the compiler error, that's one way of limiting the compiler. And now we'll talk about ways of limiting the CPU. It's very important to know that the Toji must issue the correct fence. If it does not have the correct fence, it must issue a stronger fence. We distinguish between full fence, which is like the fence we saw before. Everything before the fence has to stay above it. Everything under it has to remain under it. And one-way fence that allows to go on one way, but not on the other. We'll talk about, the, about this a bit uh, later. And this is process 11. The language did not have memory model, so no, there was no standard way of writing concurrent programming in C++. All the synchronization mechanisms that we normally use have this built in. So if I'm using mutex, the mutex will take care of all this for us. The memory model of C++ is CSDLF. CS means that the result of the execution is the same as if the reads and writes occurred in some order and the operation of each individual processor appeared in the sequence in the order of the program. Basically, it means that if I have A and B, X and Y, I can see, I can see A and B, then X and Y, or I can see A, X, B, Y. I can't see B, A, because it's not the order it was written. This is very, very slow. Database means simultaneously accessing an object by two threads, at least one of them is a writer, without happens before relationship. As simultaneously is without happens before relationship. So what all this basically means is that the C++ standard guarantee allows us to pretend that what we write will, be, will run sequentially consistent, that the program that we wrote is what the CPU will actually run, as long as you don't write any data bases. So if here, I swap, I swap this instead of a bare variable into atomics. Now there's no data race. And now this is fine. Because if I get a root store here, it insinuates it's atomics. And now it's fine. What it basically means is answer the sequence before before a uh, finish. <coughs> because the problem is just written before in the code. This loop is also sequence before the answer. This load synchronizes with the store and establishes a happens before relationship. And before this because this happens before this and this sequence before this, this sequence before this, this has to be happened before this. I know if you did not understand it before I explained it, you still don't understand it. And we'll come back to this example and I'll explain it in a few, a bit further in a few slides. Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, if the answer is uh, not volatile. It's not volatile. Uh, it will still work correctly. This is not volatile. It is still guaranteed to work correctly. Even I think the answer is not uh, not atomic. Not volatile. It's not volatile here. It's not volatile. Okay. What I wrote here is non. There's no volatile. And here, yes, it's, it's guaranteed to work correctly, even if it's uh, even if it's not atomic. If answer is not atomic. That's the how do we take care of. Another very important point is that it's transitive. So if I'm setting that in, into 42, then store one flag, on second call, wait for the first flag, and then mark the second flag, then the third core, wait for the, sec for the second flag, 
and then asserts that we saw the first assignment, this will never uh, fire. This assert will not fire. I think this is one of the most beautiful demonstrations ever because it, sho it shows a CPU reordering on x86, which 886 is very, very strong uh, ordering. It hardly does not do any reordering, and still this example shows reordering in action. I first saw this example in Jeff Preshing's blog, Preshing.com. Excellent blog, highly recommended to read. He doesn't publish it very often nowadays, but still, the, the amount of data it has there is excellent. So let's assume that x and y, r x and r y are all initialized to zero. We have one thread that sets x to one and r y to y. The second thread does r does y equals one and then r x equals x. <coughs> Take a second to look at it and to convince yourself that there is no real way, if you execute this way, the law, uh, into living that can cause r y and r x both to be zero. Okay. In order for r y to be zero, we have to have this one run first. But if we have this one run first, x equals zero, and then this one will not be zero. So either thread has to run first. At least one thread has to run first. They run Why? together. No. How? You can have a context switch after. Yeah, if I have context switch, one will run first. Okay. R y will equal y. It's one about who finishes first. And then R x equals. So that it will be one. What is what is compiler variable? You should never get zero and zero. That's what Compiler variable means that the compiler is not allowed to swap them. Why? The compiler. The compiler is allowed to swap. No. The compiler variable means is an instruction for the compiler telling it don't swap. It's the first example that I saw with uh, oh. Godbolt. Okay. Okay. There's no way that it, it, both of them would be zero. Okay. So the way that uh, we can't run a lot of threads every time. So the way that uh, we want to test it is, let's start with this thread. I'm waiting on the fir on first semaphore. Do x equals y, compiler better, and now y equals y. Exactly the same on the other thread. And I, I loop infinitely. The main thread just initialize everything to zero, for, uh, tell the two threads to start, wait for them to finish, and then check if both x and y are zero. And go and loop again. Okay? We just want to run it many, many, many times. So one in a hundred or one in a thousand will have it. So I'm actually running it, that's what we have. We can see that we did have almost every 200 uh, iteration, we have reordering. What do you mean by reordering? Both are zero. The only way for both to be zero is that the compiler will swap as this, the, sorry, the CPU will swap as this one or this one or both. Wouldn't the CPU, given the same code, do the same thing every time? No. Does it have to? It depends on the, day, on the data availability. If I have this one, it won't do, no, it won't do exactly the same. But uh, in order to get this data, uh, I did add some random delay on each one of them. Otherwise, it's very hard to catch it. But it won't always do this. Do the, So we just have the fence. Just like we have compiler barrier, we have memory barrier, or compiler barrier, or CPU barrier, machine barrier. Uh, we'll see. Uh, 
uh, on the last on the previous slide. So uh, there was no big difference between optimized and not optimized, right? Yeah. Or, uh, to be honest, I don't understand why there's any difference. Or, like, it's very little difference, yes. So for, for is slightly better, but uh, it's doing more. It's there's more reordering there. You see more reordering the thing. Uh, I believe more reorders, yes. No, no, less less reorder. Not half. Mm -hmm. No, that's uh, nine reorders every two thousand, and that's nine reorders every four uh, thousand. So it's about half reorders. Yes. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. You 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 print the same. Uh, Time, uh, more more or less uh, after the same time, and uh, no, uh, every time that I detect the order, you you I, I, I print. No, you print. You, you have five reorders, nine reorders. Uh, yeah, on lo one line. So a line uh, represents uh, uh, time slice. So it's there. No, 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 it increases. It's increases. What can I increment them? Every here. What I check. It's accumulating every time it happens. No, I print. You print a line. It's not a time. Print a line. It's a counter. Oh, it's, it's a counter. It's, it's a counter. counter. After, uh, two. I see. I see. Okay. Two. Okay. So just a quick test. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, this this barrier will stronger. Yeah. Compiler barrier would go in, uh, on any atomics, any fence, any function call that is that has a barrier will also act as a barrier. Actually, every function that is not inlined and not marked as uh, pure is also a barrier. If it's a inline, then it's not. If it's a function that was generated in a link time, then it's not. But most, no, most normal functions that we have are also compiler barrier. Is, it, yeah. is there a reason to use the compiler barrier since it doesn't work? Excellent question. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. This way, you know that you understand what I'm talking about. The name of a compiler barrier is signal fence. And that's insinuate on the only reason to use it. It's only when I know when I know that I want to forbid reordering for a signal core. And the only reason to forbid for signal core is normally in signal handler and things like this. When I'm talking about concurrency, no, I, I, there's very little to do with this with this compiler barrier. Very, very, very careful. <laughs> How is the fence uh, implemented? After Flash to memory. It depends. It depends on the architecture. But even in uh, x86, it's uh, MEM fence. Some architecture has. It depends on the architecture, but it's basically some sort of flash to memory. It's fla if it's a full fence, it's flash before, or flash after. It's one way that it's so it's quite expensive. Yeah, and that's why. We're going into this. Non sequentially co uh, consistent atomics. What we talked about so far, sequentially consistent is very, very expensive. So sometimes we want to, to do a bit less to allow some reordering, but not everything. So the first uh, non sequentially consistent atomic that we have is relaxed atomics. What you relax to is guaranteed is atomicity. We can't see torn reads, we won't have torn reads or torn writes. If I'm assigning, I'll see either the value before or the value after. I won't see anything in the middle. <coughs> if I wrote, I can still see the value before. And after, I can still see the old value, but it will not, because it doesn't enforce any ordering. But I won't see anything in the middle. I'll see either the old or the new. Another bit of overlooked uh, thing that uh, relaxed atomics gives us is that to read, modify, write, we'll always see the last value. So if two threads are incrementing the same atomic variable in exactly the same cycle, it's guaranteed that it will be incremented twice. 
and I'll see the, the correct result. Yes? Is this relevant when uh, you are uh, changing in primitive value, which is also cash aligned? Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when can it be non-atomic, even without using atomics? You don't talk about cash aligned, you talk about naturally aligned, I, I believe. Yeah. Is natural aligned, okay, Intel does guarantee, recently admitted that <coughs> if I have a, a if I'm accessing a variable, for example, in, that is the, the word size, and a, it's naturally aligned, it would be atomic. The standard does not guarantee this. This is for Intel. That's really aligned, you mean it's aligned to four bytes? In yeah. The standard means it's a not free property, which is basically that. Yeah. Okay. Most of them are uh, flag does not have, yes, but. No, it, whether they are or not, they have a test to yeah. see whether they are free or not. If they are free, they basically they guarantee. They, they guarantee. Mm -hmm. But. Means you have one, one output, right? The thing, uh, uh, because uh, atomic in, we know that it, the plus, plus that setting it, for example, would be, if it, as long as it's naturally aligned, would be atomic, then yes, it does. We want them to generate a lot of code for us. So, so hypothetically, government in an atomic int on an Intel architecture, it would be not doing atomic just yeah. by doing nothing. Yeah. Guaranteed. It's guaranteed? Uh, yes. For normal rights, I think. Yeah. For atomic, yeah, it would be doing not free. That's why, in one hand, using all these atomics in Intel is very cheap, because we already pay for it, even if we don't need it. Yeah. But it's also, it's also mostly redundant. It's supposed to be done, but you know, if you write code, write correctly. <laughs> Atomics in, in Intel, when we talk about ints, for example, yes. A lot of the reordering that we we'll talk about, Intel will not do it anyway. Will not, will not allow this reordering anyway. What did you run your program? This was Intel. That's why I love it, because that's one of the rare reordering that you can actually catch. It's very simple, and it's running that Intel uh, does allow. That's why I love it. So if I just need the counter, that will not do anything, I won't have any, just want to count things, not like reference counting or anything. Atomics is enough, because read modify write will always give me the correct value. It does not that do anything about reordering. So one thread can see operation A and then operation B. Another thread can see operation B and then operation A. The second consecutive uh, sequential consistent atomics is acquire release. The mass work in tandem. There's no point in using just acquire or just release. Acquire means read or load. Release means store. Operation sequence before the release will be visible to any operation sequenced after the acquire that synchronized with, this re with that release. It does not provide global ordering, and I bet you don't understand a word of what I said, so let's look at an example. It was what you showed. It's this. We go back to the example that I showed before. So I have a finished load of memory acquire. It failed. Okay, maybe I'm now, I didn't execute it yes, yet. So it failed, so I'm iterating again. Maybe now it already executed this store, but this core does not see the, the result. So it failed again. The fact that I'm using query release does not mean that I'll see the last value. Maybe this was already stored by now. I still did not see it. Now I see it. I do it again and now I see it. So it establishes, it synchronizes with each other and establishes a happens before relationship. So basically it means that every operation after this load, 
for example, this operation, we'll see a real operation that happened before this store. Okay? So now when I show this again, I believe that now it will make a bit more sense. Those are sequenced before each other. So before, the, because the acquire synchronized with that release, we establish a happens before relationship between them. <laughs> kind of make sense? Yeah. So let's look at a bit more complicated example. It's actually a lot, lot of wording here, but it's not so complicated. Let's look at these two threads. We have four threads here. All of this thread is doing thread write to one write store x into true, set x to true, and write to two sets y to true. Okay? Now what this does, wait till x is set to true, and check if y is true. If both are true, it sets both sets to true. <coughs> this thread does the same thing in the reverse order. Check that y is true. Y for y to be true. Checks that x is true. And if x is set, sets uh, both sets to be both set to be true. The idea here is If this is false, okay? If this is false, it means that y happens before x. After, uh, after, after x, sorry. Yeah. That y, so this must be true, right? So which memory orders do we need here? Acquire, release, situation consistent. The writer should be. That's what I expected to hear. And that's like the... That's intuition, right? But it's not. They both have to be sequentially consistent, which is the most expensive uh, fence. It's the only fence that actually generates machine code in x86. The two threads both this and thread do not have to, have to agree on the order. This thread can see x and then y, and this can see y and then x. So not only that, we have to think now about two things happen exactly on the same cycle. We don't have, we, we can't even count on, on order. One thread can see things in one order, and the other thread can see Things in another order. Sequentially consistent provide guarantee about global ordering. If one thread sees operation A and then operation B, and not all threads will see operation A and then operation B. That's sequentially consistent. Acquire release do not provide this guarantee. So one thread can see operation A and then operation B, and thread Another thread can see operation B and then operation A. So it's like, if your operations are idempotent, basically you don't mind trying again, you get, can get a uh, more relaxed order, basically. Not necessarily. It, happened, it worked before because I had just one order. I had two threads, one order between them. Now I, what I care about is the order between two different threads. One thread needs to see the order of two, two other threads. And this is only guaranteed with sequentially consistent. I need global state, not just the order in one state. But so as you can see, it's not very simple. <laughs> yes? You can have two local states. What do you mean? So if, if, you, if you, have, you go back to the threads, so if if the uh, if the second one instead of if if y you had if uh, y dot load memory order. It, uh, no, it, it still will not happen. Right. I need to I need to put it here. First of all, you write. I need to uh, to correct it. 
but it still won't help. If it would be in a while, then... If this would be in a while, and this is in a while, yes, but the idea is not, not to say in a while, I want to say that one happened first. If I'm checking both, then yes, I'll, 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 for, I'll force it, yes. But I want to say that the, what I want to show you is the order. That this one says y first, and this one says x first. I can make this a, a sequentially consistent. Then that y does it disimulating on memory tags, and that's uh, hard to see the memory tags? Yeah. That's going to be very clever. It's going to be very clever. And y will constantly. Yeah. That's why log free, most people try to write log free, do it wrong. And when we talk about relaxed atomics, it's even worse. Should you ever use it? If you look, most of the talk says don't ever use it. I think I need to think about it because it is very it can be very expensive. So the question we need to ask ourselves is. Does every microsecond count? Is it really now a hot path? Is, do I know that this is a problem? Do I know that the fact that I'm using security consistent is problematic? Can I have massive testing and massive review about it? Reviewed by someone that knows what they're talking about. And when I say about massive uh, testing, I'm not talking about living into the QA. I'm talking about extracting what we're writing, for example, the reference count of the container that we're writing, and having a very low stress, very low stress on it, with a lot of contention, to make sure that it always works. And probably the most important thing is it's a known pattern. A lot of the pattern that we see, reference count, just a counter, a done flag, are known patterns that we already have solutions for. So if it's a known pattern, I can adapt it. But if you're adapting it, you copy it, don't just copy it. Understand the reasoning why every memory fence was said the way it is. Make sure the assumption they have and the reasoning still holds with your code. And only if all of these two then use. Then consider using a non sequential consistent. And after you che check it, after you changed it, measure again. Make sure it gives you the better the, the performance improvement that you hoped for. And if it does not, we'll have it back to sequentially consistent. Let's talk about something a bit more practical. Let's look at this object. We have here some class with position, speed, some sort of model, name, and foo. Let's look at this update function. What is the most expensive operation that we have here? Square. Let's check. We need to load pose. That's the cache, it's 200 cycles. We need to load speed. It's the same cache line. So, uh, three cycles multiply and add twice. So it's another five cycles twice, another 10 cycles. The square root, 30 cycles. We need to load the uh, full. It's another cache, it's another 200 cycles. And then, we, and then we add them into one cycle. Can we do better? Pass and pull in one, in one cache. Exactly. Cache time. First of all, the thing that we need to understand is the compiler cannot help us here. Because any 50, 50 cycles out of the 450 are real work. Now, the compiler is very, very, it's not allowed to change our data layout. So, and it's a ability to check, to change our prefetching is very, very limited. So, basically, all that the compiler has to play with all of its domain is the 50 cycles, which is not very lot, very much. But as Baruch has already mentioned, if you just move foot two lines up, we cross this line. We don't need to uh, load the cache line again, and now we're down to 250 cycles. Can we do even better? Most times that we'll do it, we'll just go in a loop and update all of them. 
we have a container of, of objects and we'll update all of them. Can we do it even better? Structure of arrays. Structure of the objects. Yeah, we want to regroup the data, basically. So, on the position object, I'll put to another object, <coughs> and I'll have a vector of just position objects. So with one cache and I, I get now few objects. So the fetching cost is shared between multiple objects. So in average, it takes something like 40 cycles. So with that, I'll put 90 cycles for, this, for the same function. Just a very, very few uh, things that we need. So that already design actually mean, what it, the highlight of it is, we want to make continuous tightly packed chunks of memory that would be used consecutively. It's called structures of array. Yeah, exactly. This is not the term. No, there's array of structs and structure, structure of array. Mm -hmm. Okay. Transpose. Mm -hmm. So we group the field according to the usage, and according to the needs and transformation we want to do about it. Now, one of the criticisms that we hear a lot about, about this idea is that it makes the code a lot less re readable. So from my personal experience, the first time that I did something like this was exactly the opposite, in order to make the code more readable. I took some part of the object that had to do with invalidating it to another object, just so it would be easier for me to reason about. I'm grouping the things according to their logical, the way that I'm using it. Because in the end of the day, the, the whole idea of any program to write is to take data from one form and to transfer it to another form. Take one thing. So if I'm grouping it according to the usage, it's much easier for me sometimes to reason about it. Let's look at this. Let's say that I want to search in all the objects for a certain key or a certain condition. Okay? What I do here is I, I took the, the keys out of the object into another array. So I just check all, all this variable, all this array, which is tightly packed. Have, if it's a Boolean, I can have like loads of them. In one cache time, I can have 512 okay. Boolean. So I, I don't need to load the whole object, just for a small subset of it. So I take the subset that I need, the key that I need, take it out, scan this, and only when I need, I, lo I load the whole object. And, and each separate... Array. Yeah, I, I need to. I need to find the, either to, to have it together or to have a point in between this one to so the other. Basically, don't turn it into one map. Not really, because this is, this is consecutive. Map is not consecutive. Mm -hmm. Now I can look here, for example, if it's an integer, I can look once for all those that are greater than 5, between 8 and 4. I can check the, the key in many ways. So why would you look for a key in order to determine where to find the object? That's what I misunderstood you. I want, to perform an, I, want to perform an, I want to perform an operation only on the subset of, uh, of the objects, only on the green objects, for example. All the greens I want to delete. So I want to load the whole object, the whole object, 200 cycles to load an object, just to check the color, one byte of it. Then to load the other one, check one byte of it. I want to just read all the colors. So like in a I database, you'd pick a column or more than a column for indexing. Yeah. <coughs> That's really resemble to data oriented design versus object oriented design. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's, it's got drawbacks. You need to handle object lifetimes. It's going to be more complicated. Object lifetime going to be more complicated. I mean, it's actually, it sounds very, very simple. Data oriented design sounds very, very simple. Actually, when you come to practice, it's very, very complicated. Which uh, fields I'm carrying out. 
because a lot of times I use the same field in different places. So it sounds very easy, in practice it's not. But when you do it correctly, and when you can do it, it can generate much more readable, much more easier to maintain code many times, and definitely much faster code. Let's look at polymorphism. I have a array of shapes, that's like the poster child of object oriented, and I'm just going through this array and drawing it. Now, the shapes are very likely to contain, the first one would be a square, then I'll have a circle, then a polygon, then a square again, then text, then rectangle, and for each one of them I need to load the instruction. So I'm loading the instruction to draw square, load, load then everything, then I'm ditching it, loading all the instruction to draw a circle, ditching it, loading everything, to, and the cache is always cold. So if instead I'll the instruction cache. The instruction cache, yeah. If we'll group all the circles together and all the rectangles together, all the squares together, I'm first drawing all the all the all the, all the circles. So I'm bringing all the circles together, loading it once, drawing everything. But you can hide it in the implementation of your container. I'm changing the implementation. I'm changing the. This is the usage that you're doing now. Yeah. You can see the example example. can still remain fully polymorphic, but inside your container, you're going to be aware of what you're storing. I can, yeah, I can, I, can, I can sort it. I can have a sort mm -hmm. of it. But if I'm doing it this way, I can also devirtualize it. Draw does not have to be virtual, virtual now, mm -hmm. because I'm using circle. On the downside, we lost the order. We don't have the order that we had before, so if ordering is important... You need to be aware of all the possible yeah. shapes. So you need to have another yeah. structure that handles the order. But if I need to draw in the order that was implemented, then it's not good enough. Yeah. Again, it's not one size fits all. That's an idea. Uh, Why be able to it? We can template that. Yeah, the actual writing is the easy bit. The fact that to, instead of having like one uh, array of all of different types of shapes, to have different arrays for everyone, that's the for, that's that's the more important. Uh... Before I go to my previous, when we talk about cache oblivious, otherwise we're not oblivious to the existence of the cache. We're oblivious to the characteristics of the cache of of the cache. And we're trying to maximize the cache sheets. Because we're oblivious to them. So they very good. <laughs> and the good thing that I didn't uh, Because we're oblivious to the level of the hierarchy and optimize it, it will go through all the hierarchy, not optimizing it to L1 or L2. Because I'm oblivious, it will work on all of them. It can be a uh, cache overall can be better. But it's specific for one hour, for one hierarchy of cache, and one uh, specification of cache. When we want to uh, analyze the performance of a uh, cache with this algorithm, we still use big O notation, but with an idealized model. We ignore cache hierarchies, we ignore replacing policies, we assume that we have the best uh, replacing a, a policy. We ignore sensitivity, we assume full sensitivity, and it's still within constant from a non idealized model. Let's take an example. We want to search a sequence of numbers for the highest number which is, not, uh, which is less than x. Okay? We can assume that we can, we're going to uh, create it once and search 20 times. So we ignore the preparation time, and we want to make it as fast as possible, the search. So because I only have five minutes, I'll spare you the uh, tele suggesting binary search. Binary search will uh, require log A minus log B of cache misses. Given the distance, almost every jump would be a cache miss. Only in the end, we'll have 
uh, it will be the same cash line. So it's log n minus log b. b is the size of the cash. So I want something a bit better than this. If you had a B-tree and the size would be a cash line, if you require log ba uh, base b of n steps, which will require log n divided by log b memory abscesses. Because that's the height. The problem is that it's not a uh, cache of We don't know what the size of b is. So the solution is uh, Van and the boss. Full description of the analysis of this algorithm is beyond the scope of this talk. But the idea is we'll first set a fully balanced tree, then we constantly divide it into subtrees, then store each subtree in sequential memory and use this to search. So if I have this tree, I divide it into subtrees. Then every subtree I divide again into subtrees. And again and again and again here, there's not any more to search. And each one of them, let's look at a small subtree. Each subtree I store in a sequential memory. Okay? <coughs> so intuitive analysis. Each section is size B or less because I kept dividing it. Is that a heap? No, it's not a heap because I'm, uh, not exactly. Let's. So by going sequentially, you actually traverse the tree. I traverse the tree. So each section that I that is sequentially is size B. So it maximum two or more uh, cache pieces. Is this oh, part? Sorry. It's maximum two cache pieces. The height of the tree, that of each section is log b. The height of the, the whole tree is log n. So I'll have to visit log n minus log b divided by two uh, sections. OK? So it means that I have four log n divided by log b memory accesses. Or why two accesses per section? Because this section is up to a cache line, but it's not it's not going to be aligned to a cache line, so maybe oh. it's two. So it's not as good as the B tree that we have, but it's within constant from Can uh, you align it to a cache line? Like not really thing? because I don't know what the cache the whole idea is that oh. I don't know the, the cache characteristics. So it's not as good as uh, what we hope for, but it's still better than, uh, for example, binary search. <coughs> most of the sequentially consistent, uh, uh, most of the cache oblivious algorithms are divided on concord. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>